Jeremiah chapter 14. We're starting to get a little chilly out here in the, in the great white north. And uh, so in the midst of all of what is going on, in Jeremiah's world here in Israel. The Lord speaks on various subjects for Jeremiah to digest and retranslate, retransmit in an accurate fashion to the peoples. And we have a little canoe pie with us today. Yeah, it's our little sweet little mascot. He's, he's still in training, but he's, uh, he's coming along real well. So Jeremiah sometimes gets the word of the Lord in pits, in prison, in stocks. You know, I mean, where they, they, they put him in the stocks and throw stuff at him and beat him and that kind of thing. Sometimes just conducting regular business, God speaks to Jeremiah. Now in Israel, there's a little bit of a famine or a dearth, they called it. And it's a God trying to get the people's attention. I wish God could get the attention of the people in our country. That our country, truly, only God can make America great again. Jesus Christ cleansing the hearts of Americans from coast to coast. But that takes a willingness, a willingness from the peoples. I'm willing. Are you willing? If you're an American, perhaps you're living in foreign countries, if you're willing, God will cleanse your heart, ordain your ways, Establish a precedent in your life. And then to influence your little circle of people that you know and have dealings with. And then perhaps your circle of influence will then spread out to your circle of con concern. And then you can share the word of God and be salt and light to those who are you are concerned about. God gets people's attention in nations, lands, regions, by sometimes calamity. Israel is going through one of those right here in Jeremiah 14, so let's get a move on here. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the dearth. Judah mourneth, and the gates thereof languish. They are black unto the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem is gone up. And their nobles have sent their little ones to the waters. They came to the pits and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. On our properties here, uh, where we live, we have a cistern. Actually, we have more than one cistern. And they, they cause problems. But there's always water in the things here in this part of the world. Perhaps um, back in the old days when they put them in the ground 100, 120 years ago for our little homestead, they were very wise because sometimes there was long periods of time where there wasn't rain and they just couldn't turn on a spigot. Israel was totally dependent upon the cisterns. It was very important to have cisterns. By the time of this writing for Israel and for Jeremiah's preaching to the people, the cisterns have gone dry. And they've gone dry 
because of their rebellion, because of their sin, their wickedness. Verse 4, because the ground is chapped, for there was no rain in the earth, and the plowmen were ashamed, and they covered their heads. Yea, the hind also calved in the field and forsook it, because there was no grass. The wild donkeys did stand in the high places. They snuffed up the wind like dragons. Their eyes failed because there was no grass. You've got no water in a desert terrain. No water, no grass, no food. Verse 7, O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake, for our black backslidings are many, and we have sinned against thee. O oh, the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof, in time of trouble, why shouldest thou be as a stranger in the land, and as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry for a night? Why shouldest thou be as a man astonished, as a mighty man that cannot save? Yet thou, O Lord, art in the midst of us, and we are called by thy name, leave us not. Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet, therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Sometimes Jeremiah is a hard book to go through because Israel never really just repents of their sin. They, they don't learn. Jeremiah was like the guy that never ever saw fruit in his ministry. He just kept giving the word of God to them and they just kept doing the same dumb stuff. That's kind of like a lot of us, huh? There was a time in my life that I did a lot of dumb stuff. And, and God forgive me, and he has. And, but he's also allowed me to come full circle and to share the word of God with those that were still kind of stuck in the same rut as the generations ago, the decades ago that many of us were stuck in. And that's, that's kind of how God works, right? He kind of rescues us, you know, dum-dums, so that, you know, the years later, we can help minister the word of God to rescue those that are still living in dum dumville right? So praise the Lord for his mercy. He was very merciful to Israel. He was very merciful to me. But eventually, if you refuse to repent, God, God does act. And he did act upon Israel. Verse 11. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. When they offer burnt offerings and an oblation, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Kind of interesting. There's a time that you know you're living in sin, you know you're in a shacking up with somebody, you're living in drunkenness, or you're addicted to heroin or coke or crack. Perhaps you're a liar, you tell lots of stories about people around you and spread it around. Perhaps you're a murderer and you're kind of living underground. Perhaps you're an adulterer and you don't want to come clean. Eventually, God will intervene. God has had contact in your life. You know what's right, you know what's wrong. And if you refuse to repent, eventually God will put down the bear's hammer in your life. As a people, as a family, as a nation, God will deal with mankind. Because in the end, God always wins. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine. But I will give you assured peace in this place. A lot of people are saying that now. Look at, you know, God's not going to judge our nation because of the Sodom and Gomorrah laws. It's like they want to turn America into Sodom and Gomorrah and say, no, that's progress. That's not progress. That's uh, deprivation, you know, where guys are marrying guys and girls are marrying guy, girls and 
adopting little girls and little boys like it's normal. You know, guys are going to the bathrooms, you know, the big old laws. It's an abomination. God will bring judgment if it continues. He will judge. He judged Sodom and Gomorrah. He will judge our country, your country. Eventually, he will judge. As Romans chapter 1 makes it very clear where he stands with that type of lifestyle, that type of sin, takes it to the next level of demonic activity. Because the homo lifestyle is demonic. It's depraved. It's insane. It's a sin that has to be repented of, like any other sin, yes. But that is a sin that will bring judgment upon your life, your area, your country, your family. Because that type of lifestyle destroys. It's abomination to God. It's abomination to the morals of mankind that God has set forth. And God will judge it. The false prophets... Welcome, all change, the, the rainbow lifestyle into the church. That's an abomination. And they're prophesying peace, peace and love. You cannot disobey the word of God and have peace and love. Verse 14, Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, and a thing of naught and deceit of their own heart. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say, The sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour out their wickedness upon themselves. Therefore thou shalt say this word unto them, Let mine eyes run down with tears night and day, and let them not cease, for the virgin daughter of my people is broken with a great breach and with a very grievous blow. If I go forth into the field, then behold the slain with the sword, and if I enter into the city, then behold them that are sick with famine. Yea, both the prophet and the priest go about into a land that they know not. Hast thou utterly rejected Judah? Hath thy soul loathed Zion, O Lord? Why hast thou smitten us and there is no healing for us. We looked for peace, and there is no good. For the time of healing, and behold, trouble. We acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. Do not abhor us for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember, break not thy covenant with us. Are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Art not thou he, O Lord our God? Therefore we will wait upon thee, for thou hast made all these things. In the midst of God's declaration to Judah, Jeremiah himself cries out to the Lord, O oh Lord, you are a merciful God. Please don't forget us. Because Jeremiah can kind of see how things are going. He can see the people are not repenting. They're not turning. He wants mercy. But God has already said to them, don't, don't cry out to them. Don't pray for them anymore. Because the judgment that's going to come of their unrepentance is going to come. Because they refuse to repent. I hope and pray that does not happen to our country does not happen to our lives or your lives. God has a plan. God has a, a, a ticket, a doorway to freedom. And that freedom is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Back in the Old Testament days, they had a very firm, rigid doorway to enter. And it was a set of laws, ordinances that had to be kept rigorously. But they didn't have the freedom 
that we have in Jesus Christ. I can just say, dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. You can do the same and then change your life. Confess your sins. Praise the Lord for that. I'm very thankful that we live in the New Testament times. Israel had their opportunity to repent. America has had their opportunity to repent. Ed McAllen has his opportunity to repent. And you out there, you have had your opportunity to repent. So if you have enter into that life of repentance and faith and love in Jesus Christ, I pray continue. And for those brothers and sisters around you that are struggling, grasp them, sometimes scolding, sometimes rebuking, sometimes casting them out of your body, out of your family, out of your church. But when they repent, to welcome them back in. If they're willing to change, welcome back in. But if those that continue in sin, they are to be rebuked in the presence of all so that the other may fear unless they fall into the same set of sins. And that's all love. It's all love. It's so that you don't spend eternity in hell. That's love. God bless you, friend. See you next time.